Well, <clears throat> good, good evening, everybody. I'm very delight, delighted also to be here at uh, Schumacher College and at this beautiful state. And uh, Clara and I are very, very, we feel very welcome and we feel part of a community that is uh, thinking about issues that are so important for the future of the planet, uh, from the transformation of, the, of, uh, of um, nature and in a positive way and agriculture, but also the transformation of ourselves because that's fundamental. Uh, <clears throat> so really what's going on today is that we have a clash of paradigms in, in agriculture. We have two types of agriculture that exist in, in, in the world. One is the industrial agriculture that is based on, on agrochemical inputs and, and the Green Revolution approach. And then the other one, which we could call the peasant agriculture, or the small farmers agriculture, which uh, has been for centuries utilizing uh, what we call today agroecological principles. And this industrial agriculture dominates uh, the agricultural lands of, of today. We have about 1.5 billion hectares of agriculture. 80% of those is under these industrial monocultures that are highly dependent on external inputs that uh, require tremendous amounts of energy and they have become a major force of transformation of the biosphere because today agriculture not only affects the areas in which it's embedded but also has effects on distant ecosystems like for example oceans where we have dead zones today from the, uh, from the pollution of, of, of rivers that then end up in the ocean with fertilizers that pr promote algae growth and things of that nature. So it is really perhaps the most important force that is transforming the biosphere in, in, in different ways. And these monocultures uh, may have uh, some temporary economic advantages, but really uh, they don't represent an ecological optimum because they are so simplified systems, they are so homogeneous, they don't have species diversity, they have genetic homogeneity that make the, these systems highly vulnerable to pests and diseases and, and also to uh, climatic variability. As a matter of fact, uh, back in the 70s in the United States, uh, the Academy of Sciences put out uh, an alarm report, you know, talking about the vulnerability of agricultural systems in the United States because they, they suffered a tremendous loss uh, from the a, a, a disease that was affect, affecting corn, which basically resulted in a, in, in a drop um, of, um, of productivity from of from 119 million tons to about 106 million. So we're talking about like 13 million tons that were lost to an equivalent of about 18.5 trillion calories. So because of this um, vulnerability uh, of the systems that don't have the ecological mechanisms to defend themselves, we have to apply pesticides and inputs into the systems to make them um, at least a little bit sustainable. And um, on top of that, the systems are using about 80% of the water of the world and they produce about 25 to 30% of the greenhouse, greenhouse gases today. So here you can see that Europe is leading the world actually in pesticide use. Um, and, uh, and these inputs need to go into the environment at a tremendous ecological toll. It, it, in, in, the, in the UK, uh, it is estimated that if we accounted for all the impacts of industrial agriculture, not only pesticide pollution, but the loss of biodiversity, soil losses through erosion, human health impacts, and so on, it's about 208 pounds per hectare. That, that would be the, the externalities of, of this industrial agriculture, which actually is called externalities because society pays for them. The, the farmers that use them, the companies that sell the pesticides, don't pay for this cost. <clears throat> So the other thing that we're experiencing today is that the systems are becoming evidently very vulnerable also to climatic, climatic variability. So in the United States in 2012, there was the worst drought in the Midwest uh, since 50 years. And the losses, uh, there was more than a drop of 13% in the production of corn and about 8% in the production of soybean, mostly transgenic actually, because that's where most of these transgenic GMO crops are being grown in the United States. And in California today, we have uh, entered into the third year of drought. And in 2014, we already had to put out 400,000 acres out of production at a cost of about 1.5 billion losses. So one of the things that is interesting is that this modern agriculture, who is uh, what's going to be putting a limit 
on, on it is climate change. And climate change is pretty much related to this industrial agriculture because it produces, as I said, 25 to 30% of the greenhouse gases which change climate and affects the systems. Despite this <clears throat> warnings and despite this evidence that the systems are not sustainable, we still keep putting out these systems out there. And one of the biggest expressions of this, the new technology is what we call GMOs. There's about 300, uh, I'm sorry, 220 million hectares already that have been deployed. Mostly 60% of it is a soybean, uh, what is called Roundup Ready Soybean, which is resistant to Roundup, an herbicide produced by Monsanto. And basically the argument that is being used by the people that are pushing this, mainly companies, but also scientists that are funded by these companies. For example, my university, California, which is a public university, receives $500 million from BP to produce what they call um, transgenic biofuels. So <clears throat> the argument is that we need this to feed the world. But it turns out that if you start thinking about you know, whether there's one hectare of these uh, this transgenic crops that are feeding one of the one billion people that are hungry today, because that's the problem. We're not the problem. The problem is the poor people that make them less than one dollar a day and they don't have food. There's not one hectare of this 200 million hectare that's feeding one of these hungry people. Why? Because there are four crops that dominate the landscapes of transgenic agriculture. Soybean, corn, cotton, and canola. And you could argue that corn and soybean are the only ones that, that we eat. But it turns out that 50% of that goes to feed cattle, and the other 50% goes to feed cars. And the cattle is not in Latin America where it's being produced, where the poor are, or in Africa, but actually all the soybean that is produced and the corn goes to Europe and to China. So there's not one hectare out there that is feeding one of the one billion people that are hungry today. Despite that, you know, these systems continue. And basically what they do is they condemn farmers to monocultures and Roundup. You cannot diversify these systems. You cannot break those monocultures because everything will die. And then, obviously, these systems um, suffer the ecological consequences of utilizing the, the same technology over and over again, which is weed resistance. This is a field, for example, in Brazil of soybean totally invaded by weeds that are already resistant to Roundup. Here you have about 12 species that are already resistant to Roundup because that's the response of nature. We know it from entomology. You know, when you apply pesticides over, over pests, now there's about 500 different species of insects that are resistant to about 1,000 different insecticides. So the chemical warfare has an end, you know, because it produces more problems than what it solves. And on top of that, now there's research uh, coming out showing very clearly that there is some evidence in humans that, the, that, that glyphosate causes uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and also other types of, uh, types of cancers. And it is already being used in about 750 uh, herbicide products that are being you know, grown and, and sprayed throughout the world. Now, there are people that will argue, well, you're kind of a radical in your views, and there's something good about GMOs. You know? What about golden rice? You know, the, it turns out that they have produced now, and they're trying to push it in, in Asia, a rice that is able to produce beta-carotene. Uh, it's genetically engineered, because beta-carotene is a precursor of vitamin A, and vitamin A is important for vision, and there's a lot of problems in, with, with the, in, in Asia of people that have problems with vision. So what a, what, a, what a better idea, let's produce a, a, a rice that is produces the beta-carotene and you know, spread it throughout Asia. Well, it turns out, when you look at the systems, uh, the traditional systems, uh, here farmers are growing all kinds of things, not just rice. They're growing different varieties of rice, different crops when in the dry season, uh, all kinds of uh, perennial trees, fish, ducks, eels, all kinds of uh, different uh, components that when you have these systems, people don't have any deficiencies of any kind. What happens is the systems get transformed into monocultures. And then when you transform them into monocultures and people eat rice and only rice, you're going to have all kinds of deficiencies, not only vitamin A. And then with the herbicides that are being used with the Green Revolution, you eliminate plants that we call weeds in modern agriculture, but the farmers uh, actually, in Mexico, for example, they call them quelites. They are non-crop non plants that are useful, that are edible, that are medicinal, and so on. So these plants, when you look at, for example, there, 
Um, one of these leafy, leafy vegetables that we're you know, take, eliminating with the herbicides has 444 micrograms of beta-carotene per gram, when the golden rice has about 1.6. Actually, they say now it's about 6. They, they raised it up. So you have to eat about 1 kilo of golden rice to obtain what you would get from one leaf of this uh, particular weed that you're, er, you, that you're uh, eliminating with the herbicides. On top of that, when you start using chemicals in the systems, other components other than rice are affected. For example, this fish here that you see play a very important role in the system because they eliminate weeds. And some of them push the plants to force the insects that are there, and they eat them. And then on top of that, they grow um, azola, which is a plant that it fixes nitrogen. And then this azola uh, not only fertilizes the, the rice, and there's no need for fertilizers, but actually is the food of ducks, which also are playing a role in the system, but they're also producing meat and they're producing eggs. So at the end, you break this system that is totally self-sufficient. You know, these farmers, by assembling this, bi this biodiversity of ducks and fish and plants and weeds and so on and so on, basically what happens is that they have a self-sufficient farming system. This is the model of agroecology. This is agroecology is basically you, have, you assemble an ecological infrastructure where, with different kinds of biodiversity components that are going to be interacting. And through those interactions, what they do is they sponsor the fertility, the best regulation, the productivity of your system. You don't need external inputs of any kind. Basically, what you need is a lot of knowledge on how to assemble the systems and then manage them. But these systems are being broken down by modern agriculture. That's the tragedy. The other tendency is obviously biofuel production, which is also another wave of uh, you know, continue artificializing nature and, and creating these huge monocultures. And the reason why they're going into uh, into this, especially Europe and the United States that have mandates to increase biofuel use, is because um, you can see that the US and Europe, the OECD countries, use 50% of the world's energy. But, um, and then the rest of the world, which is about 170 countries, use the other 50%. So you need a different matrix of energy, because petroleum is going to become expensive, it's going to become scarce, it's in the hands of you know, Maduro or Chavez or these people that the US doesn't like. So they need to look for another uh, energy matrix, something that is not too drastically different, some liquid that we can continue maintaining the cars and, and, the, and the airplanes and all that and, and, and so on. What is that? Biofuels. But it turns out that in Europe or in the United States, there is not enough land to, grow, to produce the biofuels that you need in order to generate the biofuels. If, if you use all the corn area of the United States, they would only be able to supply 12% of the biofuel needs that they need, ethanol needs. And Europe, well, you, have, you don't have land. So where is the frontier? The frontier is in Africa and in Latin America. And basically, the process of getting this land is called the land grabbing. There is a process of land grabbing, mainly in Africa, uh, where um, you know, countries and companies come and basically make deals with these governments, many of them corrupt. And then you can see that in different countries of Africa now, we have you know, all kinds of uh, deals where uh, countries like Saudi Arabia, South Korea, China, India, and corporations come in. And there's more than 80 million hectares already in Africa in, under these deals, producing biofuels, producing some of them industrial cash crops, some of them rubber timber, but nothing for Africa. They just grow the stuff there, and they take it all. And this is just one example of um, one company you know, in Sierra Leone, where basically uh, they wipe out forests, they wipe out indigenous communities, and they grow these huge monocultures that are going to have a huge ecological toll on the planet. And on top of that, <laughs> this industrial agriculture that uses 80% of the land produces only 30% of the food, but using 70% of the water and 80% of the fossil fuel. So it's very inefficient. Because you see, corporate agriculture is not interested in producing food. They're interested in producing biomass. Biofuels, bioplastics, biopharma, whatever biomass you know, makes sense. So they only produce 30% of the food. And so why are we stuck on this type of agriculture and we think that it's so efficient that it's feeding? And that's a myth. <clears throat> and world hunger keeps going up. 
And the reason why world hunger is, goes up is not because there's not enough food out there. It's because people are poor. They don't make enough money. They, you know, one third or two thirds of the population in the world are making less than $3 a day. So access to food is a huge issue, inequalities. We are throwing away 115 kilos of food per year on average in the United States and, and Europe. If we were able to kind of move that food into Africa, we would solve the problem immediately. So the real reason why we have hunger in the world is because the agricultural system, the food system, is controlled by corporations. You know, like grain merchants, like ADM, Cargill, seed and biotechnology companies, supermarkets, ADM, and so on. And basically, what we have is food empires that are controlling what the producer will produce, how much they will produce, for whom they will produce, with what technology they will produce, and then the consumers. You know, they're all vertically integrated, so you have the big supermarket chains that determine what you're going to eat, how much you're going to pay, what's the quality of your food. And they basically have the, the, the food system totally strangled. So the challenge for the next uh, decade, the immediate challenge, because the future is already here, is that food production must, must increase sustainably. It's a, it's a, it's a sufficient condition. It's not, a, it's not an, a, a, you know, the, 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 the condition that, that, that is needed, but it's, but it's, but it's, uh, it's needed to, to increase production, but it's not the solution. But the problem is that we're going to have less arable land or less quality of arable land less petroleum, less water, less nitrogen in a scenario of climate change, OK? So what we say in agroecology is that this challenge cannot be met with the existing industrial model and its biotechnological derivations. What we need is a new paradigm. And that's where the new agriculture comes in. What, these are the, the features of this new agriculture. It has to be decoupled from fossil fuel dependence. There have to be agroecosystems of low environmental impact, nature friendly, resilient to climate change, multifunctional, not only they produce food, but they produce social, ecological, cultural services, and they must be the foundation of local food systems, because it turns out that in about 15 to 20 years, 75% of humanity is going to live in cities. And a city of 10 million people, which there will be about 50 of them in, in 15, 15 years from now, have to import 6,000 6, tons of food per day which must travel about 1,000 1, kilometers. So can you imagine the energy costs, the emissions, and the fragility of cities that have to depend on bringing food every day, you know, 6,000 uh, tons of food per day. So what we're looking for is an agriculture that it has high productivity, that has high diversity, that has high efficiency, and that's what agroecology is able to do. Because what you do is you, did, you, you devise systems that have very high levels of integration of crops and livestock and trees, you know, that through the interaction sponsor the function of the system. There's very high recycling rates, and it, they don't depend on external inputs, not even organic inputs, maybe at the beginning in the transition. So they're very efficient systems. And when you start thinking, where do we find this type of agriculture? Well, it turns out that there are people that have been farming in the third world 5,000 years, generation after generation, for example, in the Andes of Latin America, or in Mesoamerica, in Mexico, Central America, or in the lowland tropics of, uh, of, of uh, South America, in Brazil, in Colombia, and so on, or if you go to Af Africa and Asia, you will find peasants that traditionally have been farming for more fa than 5,000 years. And there, in the world today, there's about 1.5 billion of them uh, in 380 million farms. They, uh, their average uh, size of their farms is about 2 hectares. And they have in their hands about 1.9 million varieties of crops. So they have a tremendous wealth of genetic diversity in their hands. The Green Revolution, with all the support of science and in the industry and so on, was able to only produce 7,000 varieties. And then on top of that, these guys are the ones that are feeding us. They produce 50 to 75% of the food, depending on the country. Um, they use, but only on 25 to 30 percent of the land, using 30 percent of the water and 20 percent of the fossil, fossil fuels. So, if we really wanted to feed the world, why don't we give land to these people instead of having 30 percent of land? Let's give them 30, 60 percent of the land, and then the problem would be immediately resolved. That, but that's a very politically sensitive issue because it requires land reform and so on. Some of the examples of these systems, if you if you go to, for example, to Mexico City. 
you go near Mexico City, about uh, 20 kilometers from Mexico City, there's this area called Xochimilco, where there's still chinampas that were used by the Aztecs five, uh, uh, thousand, uh, thousand years ago, or 500 years ago before the Spanish came. And actually, these systems were able to feed a population of two million in the, in the, in the Aztec Empire. And these systems consist of these raised beds, you know, where they have water canals. In these water canals, there's fish, but there's also these weeds that grow, and then they put them back into the system as a recycling organic matter. They practice very complex rotations. For example, you, you can have marigolds for the market, but those marigolds then are rotated with a milpa, which is the corn bean squash system. And then you get a lot of benefits from that rotation. They also grow plants that we eliminate, you know, like purslane. It's a highly edible plant. It's very part of the gastronomy of peasant agriculture in Mexico. Very, very, very resistant to drought, actually. And uh, it's interesting that one hectare of these systems could produce enough food to feed 15 to 20 people from the production of one hectare. So very efficient systems that uh, prove the, the test of time. So these farmers, um, some of them manage very complex polycultures, like if you go to cacao systems or you go to coffee systems in, in Central America or in, in Colombia or in Mexico, you'll find farmers that will be managing 150 different tree species in, a, in, 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 this, in the systems, and coffee is just part of the system. So here you can see this farmer, you know, you know trying to understand when are you going to have to go and harvest, when do you have to you know, uh, prune, when do you have to do this, but 150 species, and a tremendous amount of knowledge, ethnobotanical knowledge. And the same you know, with the milpa, uh, it's not only growing corn, beans, and squash, they also have a lot of chiles and other plants that are mixed in there. And this is part of their self-sufficient systems. And these systems are very efficient in production, production product, in, a, in productivity terms. Because when you calculate the yield of the system, and you get a value of 1.5, that means that you need 1.5 hectares of monoculture to obtain the same productivity that you get in one hectare of the polyculture. Because basically, polyculture is an overlapping of two monocultures. And they use the, 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 the resources of light and nutrients and water and sunlight much more efficiently. So that index, called the land equivalent ratio, gives you the value of efficiency of these systems. And here you can see this is data derived from 170 household farms in, in Africa that as you increase the diversity of the system, you also increase the contents of nutrients, macronutrients, minerals, and vitamins. But when you go to monocultures, you just have these systems that are totally devoid of vitamins and anything, because you, you just reduce the, 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 the diversity and you, you, you reduce the nutritional value also. So the evidence is very clear that as you increase diversity, you increase the nutritional value of these farms. And on top of that, it is very important to understand that small farms are more productive than large-scale farms. Because if you have a large-scale farm that has 1,000 hectares and produces corn, you're going, get a, a, you're going to get a yield of about 18 tons or 20 tons per, per hectare. And the small farm probably is going to get one. But it turns out that the, the small farm, in addition to producing one, uh, one hectare of corn, is producing beans, squash, chickens, eggs, ducks, this, that, that, and that's what we call the total output. So when you use total output as the real measure of the productivity of systems, then what you, you end up is with these curves on the left. Those are different countries using data from FAO. You can see that the curve goes like that, like that. The total output of the farm decreases as you increase the farm size. So really, again, more evidence that if we have small farms is the way to go to, uh, to produce food for, for the people. So agroecology, then, is a science that combines the knowledge of modern ecology and some of the social sciences and some of the advances of agronomy, like soil science and entomology and so on, with traditional farmers' knowledge. And what it tries to create is a dialogue of wisdoms from which we emerge principles. So e agroecology is, is like ecology. Ecology explains how nature works. It doesn't matter if it's a tundra or a tropical rainforest, the same process occur. Agroecology is the same. It's a, it's, a, it's a science that has universal principles that explains how agriculture works and how you're going to devise the agriculture of the future. Now, we said that one of the conditions is uh, an agriculture that is divorced from 
uh, petroleum dependency. Can you imagine that in England happens what happened in 1989 in Cuba when the petroleum imports went down from 1988 to 1982 in 77 to 63%? You know, there will be total collapse of the agriculture. I mean, all these large farms that I saw walking up here would not be able to function because they, they don't have the petroleum, they don't have the fertilizer, they don't have the pesticides. Well, that's what happened, happened in Cuba. You know, if the Soviet bloc collapsed because they had a very solidarity relationship at that time, basically the Soviet bloc was, was subsidized in Cuba and the Cuba had an agriculture was Soviet style, with huge tractors, pesticides, fertilizers, petroleum, et cetera, et cetera. Well, all that changed like that. In when the Soviet bloc collapsed. And what is interesting is that you have there different crops, and the light bar is the contribution of the small farmers when there were pesticides and fertilizers. And the black bars for each crop is after the collapse. So immediately what happened was that the, 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 the large-scale agriculture collapsed, and the ones that started having an advantage and producing the food that the island needed were the small farmers. So you can see that the contribution of small farmers was higher when there were no pesticides and fertilizers. And the way they do it is they have, you know, the agricultural practices that we, that we promote, you know, polycultures, animal integration, rotation, green manuring, organic amendments, all these practices, you know, that are the result of applying the principles of agroecology. And this is one farmer, just to show you one example, that in Santi Spiritu, that's how it started. And then this is how he ended, with a farm that has 10 hectares with very complex hedgerows of multiple use, rotations of crops and pastures, et cetera, et cetera. And here you can see the, 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 the productivity of the system. He can produce enough protein to feed 34 people with the production of one hectare per year. And the energy efficiency is the most important thing, 30. He puts one kilocalorie and he gets 30 back. There is no ag agriculture that is more efficient than this. The most efficient conventional agriculture in the United States has a, a ratio of 1.5. So this, this guy is a 20 times more efficient, ecologically speaking, than any uh, agricultural system. And what happened also is that these farmers that, that started responding you know, uh, when the crisis hit, is at that point in 1999, when, when they started what they call the special period, there were 216 farmers, members of ANAP, which is the National Association of Small Farmers, that were practicing agroecology. Look at what happened in, 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 in 10 years. It went to 110,000, and today I think there's about 130,000 farmers that are practicing agroecology, this method that I was showing you. How do they do that? It's through a movement called Campesino Campesino. It's a farmer-to-farmer -farmer network, an ex horizontal exchange of information and experiences between farmers, and it's a cultural phenomenon that is based on, on some basic rules. Here's a drawing, I'm sorry that's in Spanish, but basically that, that drawing of a person there says those are the principles of the peasant-to-peasant -peasant movement. Uh, it's a philosophy, uh, a grassroots philosophy, where it says it works on the legs of innovation and solidarity. It works with the hands of production and protection, it sees with the vision of sustainability, loves nature, family, agriculture, and community, and there's the heart, and then speaks for the right of food sovereignty, which is a new concept that actually the farmers, through a, mo a world movement called Via Campesina, were able to, to quote not too long ago. So farmers, basically, what they do they, they get together, there's uh, some promoters that go and visit the communities and teach them, for example, about soil conservation, or they teach them about green manures or how to do compost or green compost teas and different practices, or to select seeds and do what, what is called participatory breeding and improve some local varieties, and then end up with, with, with these plants, the seeds, assembling the systems that, that are needed for, uh, for food sovereignty. So this is one example of a farm in, 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 in Cuba. And I don't know if you know that in 2008, there were three hurricanes in Cuba. One was uh, Ike, and then there are two other minor ones. They say that the US cannot send them, but who knows? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and it turns out that right after the hurricanes, 
a group of scientists that are uh, associated with, uh, with, uh, with us through a, a network called SOCLA, which is the Latin American Society of Agroecology, and Clara is the president, they went to monitor which farms resisted. And there turns out that these farms that were more diversified, the farms that had hedgerows, the farms that had agroforestry systems were the ones that supported, that, that withstood. That, that means they were resilient. So here you can see the, mean, the damage on the mink carpet there was about 72% in all the systems, but category three and two were more diversified, so they suffered less damage. They still suffered damage, there were three hurricanes. But what's most important is the rate of recovery. So system number three recovered productivity much faster, which were the more diversified farms than system number one, which were the more uh, simple systems. Because resilience has two dimensions. One is resistance to the shock, and the other one is capacity of recovery. So here you can see a farm, Perla, for example, in, in, in Cuba, after a hurricane, Michel, and then the status after, after the system uh, basically uh, was recovered through agroecological management very quickly. In other areas of, uh, of the tropics, you know, pastures have been promoted by in international centers, by research institutions, by, by, by industry, like in Colombia or in Mexico, where you have huge monocultures of pastures are very productive when you have water and when you have fertilizers. When water doesn't come, like in, because they're rain-fed system, this is what happens. And with that, the cows die, and then the only system that survive are these systems, which are called civil pastoral systems, where actually you have um, a conservation of moisture, you have a, a microclimate that has a temperature of about two, two degrees less, it has much higher uh, moist, um, relative humidity, the cows are also producing manure, which actually increases organic matter content in the soil, which increases the holding capacity of water, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can see that these systems, uh, here you have rainfall and you have uh, and the top um, curve is the milk production, it basically stays stable. It doesn't matter what happens with the climate. That's resiliency, you know, a system that is able to regulate its productivity the, regardless of what's going on with, uh, with, with uh, uh, precipitation. So we see that with agroecological management, by increasing the landscape diversity, by increasing the vegetation and complexity of the system with agroforestry systems, with intercropping, with animal integration and so on, by also managing the soil organically, by water harvesting and so on, we can increase systems that are highly resilient. And then there are farmers that are also in the process of recovering their lands. Uh, they are doing uh, restoration ecology because this is in, in the Mixteca in, in Mexico. Uh, this is the inheritance of development of um, you know, large scale cat, uh, cattle uh, over, over grazing, uh, um, deforestation and so on. And there are some farmers, you can see there, there are some pieces of green spots. These are farmers that are trying to stay there because what is the future of these farmers? If they leave their land, they're gonna go to the United States and be exploited or they're gonna end up in, in Mexico City being exploited. So they want to stay there. So what they did is they stayed. So they started you know, with their hands, first of all, reforesting the top of the mountain. This is Pinos Oaxacenses, it's actually a native pine because they say that that's where the sponge of the, of the mountain is. Then they started doing soil conservation practices like this, where they, they developed these, uh, these, uh, these uh, terraces, but also these um, um, drainage um, ditches for water harvesting. This is where they harvest the water, because it's, it's not that it doesn't rain there, but it rains two, two months a year and that's it. So you have to harvest water. That's very important. You can do it also at the farm level. And then with that water, depending on how much water you harvest, then you deploy your fields, the size of your fields, so that you have enough water to irrigate whatever you're doing. So here you can see they're irrigating a field of amaranthus, which is actually another plant that is being recovered in that area because it has very high content of protein. It has about 18%. But you know the Spanish, when they came, they said that this was a pagan crop, and they, for, they, they, they said that they could not use it. They forbid it, and they introduced wheat, you know which doesn't have any protein content compared to amaranthus. So there's a big effort to recover these plants too. And this is another interesting example of the recovery of an area in Colombia. You can see in, in 1982 and 2001 and now 2013, a totally reforested watershed that allows then for a landscape that will then sponsor the, the, the possibility of setting up all these diversified farming systems. 
Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that agroecology is only for small farmers. Uh, obviously, the emphasis is there because of the strategic importance of small farmers, as I explained, in, especially in the third world. But this is an example of, in California where um, an organic farmer uh, is diversifying their crops. So here you have lettuce, but then you, they put flower strips in between because those flowers attract beneficial insects, and therefore they don't have to spray organic products because the organic products are very expensive. They increase cost of production. You don't need to use them. Why don't you put flowers, attract the beneficial insects that will control your pests? Or in the, in the vineyards, introduce you know, buckwheat, for example, or, or uh, other plants like um, um, uh, alisum that will attract also beneficial insects or uh, diversify inside your, your farm, in your vineyard, have an island of crops uh, of different plants that are going to be refuge for beneficial insects that then are going to go to your vineyard and control the pest. Uh, or strip intercropping systems, uh, just like the intercropping systems that the small farmers use, you can use them, mechanize these systems and deploy them in the field, have different rotations, different composition of these strip crops that are going to cut your cost of production, that are going to minimize pest losses and so on and so on. And there are other examples of other farms, for example, agroforestry farms that are uh, in Brazil, large scale farms where you have different types of trees growing that are going to allow for animals to come in and, and graze under the trees or have crops like a soybean, for example, between those, those trees. So the concept of food sovereignty that I was trying to explain before is a concept that the Via Campesina has adopted. That means uh, is the right of communities or farming communities or towns or regions to define their own agricultural model to prioritize productivity, first of all, for self-sufficiency, and then whatever is left over for export. Hmm? So it has three major components, and one of them is agroecology. Agroecology, then the social movements, and then the state support. So the social movements have to press the government so that the governments have to respond to the needs of farmers. So for example, in Brazil, and we have people from Brazil here, uh, the social movements organize themselves to a point that today Brazil has a national law of agroecology with a budget of $3 billion. So that's a conquest of, the, of, of these movements. And now that money is going to go you know, to sponsor agroecological systems, to scale up agroecological systems in the country. And this is the way they get organized. I mean, they're not just a few 200, 300 people that go there and blow a whistle. They just, uh, one million people, they go to Brasilia, they close, they shut down the city, and, you know, let's, let's start talking. And um, so agroecology has become now part of the discourse of, of social movements. It's in the hands of social movements. It's, much, it's a much more militant uh, science. And they say that the combination of peasant and family farm agriculture with agroecology will feed families, cities, countries, with higher productivity, efficiency, autonomy, lower costs, and so on. And why is agroecology compatible with social movements? Why is it that the social movement suddenly said, oh, this is the approach that we think is the one that will provide the technological scientific basis for our food sovereignty? It's because it's socially activating, requires participation, it's economically viable, doesn't depend on external inputs, it's culturally appropriate because respects and mobilizes traditional knowledge, it's ecologically sound because it doesn't want to change the system but wants to optimize them and provides the principles to reach food sovereignty. So recently the Via Campesina met in Mali and they came up with a declaration um, where they, see that they, they say that they see agroecology as a, sea, as a key form of resistance to an economic system that puts profit before life and then agroecology within a food sovereignty framework offers us a collective path forward to overcome the multiple crises that are affecting the world today. And they say that the real solutions to the crisis of the climate, malnutrition, etc., will not come conforming to the industrial model, so reforming it. What we need is to change it, create new systems that are based on true agroecological fruit production, etc. So, in a way then, the struggle is the following, is to try to change the food empires 
And that's what, what there's a lot of mobilization going on uh, around that, you know, to try to, to stop Monsanto, to try to stop, you know, big corporations that are controlling the food system. But on the other hand, there is a more positive approach, which is the construction of a bypass, where <coughs> farmers control territories and they create their own local markets that are solidarious, where, for example, we know of examples where farmers sell their products cheaper than organic, than, than conventional, because they create these solidarious relationships with consumers. And consumers understand that, my, but that, that supporting this type of agriculture is not only providing them with healthy food, but for example, it's, it, it, was, it, it is well known, and there's some several studies that show that cities that are surrounded by small farmers have less problems of violence or drug addiction and so on than cities that are surrounded by large scale farms. Or cities that are surrounded by small scale farms are five degrees cooler than cities that are surrounded by huge monocultures. So there's other benefits and people are starting to understand that. So the other thing is that peasant movements see agriculture as a tool for the contestation, defense, configuration, and transformation of rural spaces into territories. So there's a huge move today, uh, and it's in different ways is being achieved, uh, to create autonomous territories where they are able to define their own agricultural model without intervention from others. So in some cases, it's done by political leaders that they elect. For example, we know towns where peasants became the mayors. <laughs> and then they declare the territories free of GMOs, free of agrochemicals. We're going to promote agroecology. We're going to buy all the food of the small farmers to feed the schools and the hospitals, etc. That's one approach. Or the other one is the approach of the MST, the Land Peasant Movement in Brazil, which they just take the land. Because it turns out that in most of Latin American countries, there is a law that says that the, the land has a social function. So if you have a latifundio and you're not using your land for production, your land should be taken out by other people that are going to put it to production. So these territories are emerging. And it's a very important and exciting because these territories are reserves of biodiversity, are reserves of uh, seeds, are also laboratories of food sovereignty and so on, which actually uh, defend themselves against all these pressures like you know, transgenic crops, monocultures, uh, agrofuels, pesticides, etc., etc. So at the end then, we see that agroecology provides the foundations to create these territories to reach food sovereignty, but also you can create energy sovereignty and technological sovereignty because you see, many farmers are now producing their own biofuels, not for getting to the market of biofuels, but to produce their own energy for their tractors and, and for their trucks and so on. And the technological sovereignty comes from applying the agroecological principles. Because if you use agroecology, you don't need external technology. You don't need to buy anything. You just generate the ecological processes that are going to sponsor productivity. And all that, of course, is going to lead to resilience of the systems to climatic variability. <clears throat> and there are legal initiatives that have been, again, the result of the conquest of people, of the, of the social movements, in many of the Latin American countries, mostly uh, progressive governments. So you can have in Ecuador, for example, a law of agrobiodiversity and agroecology and seeds. And actually, in Ecuador, by constitution, is not allowed to grow transgenic crops. It's a constitutional amendment. Or Brazil, where you have the National Plan of Agroecology that I told you. Or Nicaragua, which has a law of, uh, uh, for, for promoting agroecology and, and, and organic agriculture. So there's, there are uh, legal instruments that have been uh, put in place as the result of the pressure of the people that now is a legal tool for people to demand that these things happen. And just to end here. We see, this is a study that was done by some colleagues at the University of Michigan, where you can see that there's different crops on the, on the left. And they calculated a, a, an index that if it's above one, it means that, the, that, that you're able to increase production with agroecological methods. And you can see that it's divided between developed and developing countries. And the developed countries, almost in no crop, have a value higher than one. That means. According to their analysis, there is no potential to increase agricultural production 
with uh, agroecological methods, whereas in the developed countries you do. And the reason why this, in my opinion, is, 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 is play, plays out this way is because in developing countries we have three things that unfortunately in the North are lacking. And I say in the North, especially my experience in the United States. One, we don't have the millinery knowledge. Second, we don't have the seeds because the, those 1.9 billion seeds that I was, the million seeds that I was talking about are in the hands of the peasants in the South, especially in the centers of origin. And the third, you don't have the social movements. You see, uh, we have been now touring with Clara uh, many parts of Europe, uh, Spain and Belgium, uh, now here in England. We were also in Africa recently, given a course. And one of the things that's that most people got impressed about the agroecological movement in Latin America was that it was in the hands of rural, very powerful rural movements that are promoting the change. So uh, that is not existing in California, uh, for example. There, there's not a big social movement that is going to be pushing these ideas uh, in, in, with force and, and be able to confront you know, the resistance of the corporations and so on. So it seems to me that Many people say, well, what is the potential of agroecology to happen in Europe and in the United States? I think it doesn't depend so much on knowledge and technology, because that's easy. I think it depends more on creating the movement that has to be very powerful to promote the, to push this agenda, given the, 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 the resistance that, that exists in, 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 in the society. Thank you very much. <laughs>